Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is taken from our epistle lesson, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33. Dear fellow redeemed in Christ, one day a man was talking about his marriage, and he said, when my wife and I got married, we agreed on one thing. I'd make all the major decisions, and she would make all the minor decisions. <laughs> then he paused. You know, we've been married for 28 years now, and we haven't had to make a major decision yet. <laughs> As you can probably tell, today's message is about marriage. And more specifically, what a perfect marriage looks like. Now, for those of you who know me well, know that this is one of my favorite texts to use in marriage counseling. Perhaps that's why this sermon was a little bit challenging for me. You see, there's so much meaning in this text, in these verses, that I can go on and on and on and on talking about it. But I won't. I know the game starts at noon. And so I'll be sure to wrap it up at 1130. Does that sound all right? Just kidding. As I said, Ephesians 5 is probably one of my favorite texts to use for marriage counseling. And what I usually do is I usually begin by asking the couple to read with me this text. And inevitably, from the very beginning, the girl will start to squirm a bit. And the guy will have this big grin on his face. Amen, he usually says. <laughs> and it all comes down to one word. Submit. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Verse 22. And I can understand that. I can understand why it causes, the, causes female hearts to stop or to skip a beat, and male hearts to leap. But the interesting thing is that by the time I get done with counseling, by the time we really dig into this text, by the time our counseling all wraps up, it's the woman who often asks that this text from Ephesians 5 be read in their wedding ceremony. You see, the problem we have with this text resides not in the text, but how we interpret the text. We, both men and women, become so fixated on that one little word that we forget what St. Paul says in the rest of the text. So, let me read for you what immediately follows Paul's exhortation to the wife. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, and here's the key, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Friends, I'm convinced that if more husbands would love their wives as Paul commands in this text, in other words, if we husbands would be more like Christ to our wives, our wives would really not have such a problem with that word, submit. You see, it all begins with Christ, as it always does. If we have a proper understanding of our Savior 
and his relationship to his people. And we use that as a model for our marriages. I am convinced that we cannot get marriage wrong. Indeed, I would be so bold as to suggest that if we follow the picture that St. Paul has laid out before us today, our divorce rates would come to an abrupt and immediate end. And that's the problem. We don't follow the picture Paul has presented. We fail. I include myself in that as well. We're sinners. Instead of always looking out for the wants and the desires of their wives, husbands become selfish. Instead of looking out for the wants and the desires of their husbands, wives become selfish. We look out for ourselves. We look out for our own wants and desires. Compare that with Christ. Did he look out for his own self-interest? Or did he look out for the interests of others? When the disciples were hungry, did he not feed them? When they were thirsty, did he not give them something to drink? When they were sick, did he not care for them? When their feet were filthy, did he not stoop down and wash them? Jesus did all these things and more. He served them, and in his ultimate act of service, Jesus suffered and died for his disciples. Now in our text, St. Paul says, Husbands, go and do likewise for your wives. Look out for her best interests. When she is hungry, feed her. When she is thirsty, give her something to drink. When she is sick, care for her. Treat her as the queen of the castle she is. Serve her. And oh yes, be willing to die for her. Last week's sermon was all about being imitators of Christ. Well guys, here's your chance. Imitate Christ to your wife. And I would be willing to bet that as we are more Christ-like to our wives, our wives really not have a problem with that one little word. In fact, I would be willing to bet that if we treat our wives like Christ treats the church, if we serve her as Christ serves the church, if we are willing to die for her as Christ died for the church, she would not only give thanks to God for you, but her love for you would increase and she herself would be willing to serve. Now I can, I can just hear some of you. Pastor, I'm a little skeptical about that. It's just not how it works in my marriage. It's just not how it works in life. Well, let me ask you this question. Why do we follow Christ? All of us here, why do we follow Christ? Why do we try to live according to the Ten Commandments? Why do we come to church? Why do we baptize our children? Like Alex and Bethany baptized Clark this morning. Why do we desire to receive Christ's body and blood for the forgiveness of all of our sins? Why do we do these things? Is it not because of what Christ has done for us? We live for Christ because he willingly left his heavenly home and was born in a very humiliating way. We live for Christ because he lived a perfect life for us, a life that we often fail to live. 
when we fail, Christ is there to forgive us. We live for Christ because he provides us with food and shelter and clothing and employment and a loving family and good neighbors and so on. We live for Christ because he suffered and he died and he rose again so that we might be received into heaven and be raised to eternal life on the last day. We live for Christ because of all that he has done for us and continues to do for us each and every day of our lives. And is that not submitting to him? Is that not setting aside our own selfish desires in order to live a God-pleasing life? And yet we have no problem with it. We have no problem living for Christ because we know all of the things, the good things he has done for us. We know and believe in his love for us and we can see how he has worked in our lives and in the lives of those around us. You know, I really wish verse 21 was included in our reading because I think that it sets the stage for what Paul says next in our text. Verse 21, St. Paul writes that we are to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then he goes on to say, wives, submit to your husbands. Then comes our text. You see, fellas, by serving your wife, you are really submitting to her. And ladies, by submitting to your husband, you are really serving him. And that's what marriage is about. It's an institution whereby husband and wife willingly submit and serve each other for the benefit of the other. All within the context of faith in Jesus Christ. Indeed, all of our relationships, whether we are married or single, are about submitting and serving all for the sake of Jesus Christ. And that's the key, my friends. You see, without Christ, we most often revert back to our old sinful ways. But with Christ, we are empowered to live for others. St. Paul, in our text, paints a picture of a perfect marriage where husband is a picture of Christ to his wife, and the wife is a picture of the church to her husband. I guess you could say what Paul presents before us today is a marriage made in heaven. And so this day and always, I pray the Lord's blessings upon you and your relationship as we model the marriage of Jesus and his church, serving one another, submitting to one another, out of reverence for Christ. Because Christ submitted and served us in order that we might be forgiven, in order that we may live forever. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.